tell you a few words about PyPy. So, uh, well, let's start with what is Python. Python is great, everybody knows it, I think. Uh, but people say that Python is just a glue language that we use to glue various parts together. And why, why don't we use Python left and right? Because Python is slow. So we have to write pieces in C, pieces in Fortran sometimes, and pieces in Python, and we glue fit them together using Python. And well, I find there's a citation needed, you can see quite. Uh, it's a Wikipedian professor. Uh, it's not entirely true. Somebody wrote a blog post recently where he compared PyPy with Node.js, which uses V8 as ending for running on Project Euler, which is not a very good benchmark, but it's one of the best we can get for multiple languages, and PyPy scored 29 wins against 20 for VA. So, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that slow, because everybody knows V8 is fast, it's done by Google, right? So, PyPy is not necessarily slow. It can be slow, it can be fast, it all depends. Uh, so, what is PyPy in short? Python is many, many things, but what you care about is Python is just another Python implementation. You use it by typing PyPy and then Python program and it just runs. And that's all you need to know for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, and it has few certain features. Like, it comes with a JIT compiler. JIT compiler means that you don't compile Python to say C or Assembler. You instead run the interpreter and when things get when things get hot, which means they're executed often, you compile it just in time into Assembler, knowing a few things at runtime you wouldn't know otherwise. It comes with stackless features that might be how many of you ever use stackless or greenlands? Okay, only a few people. Anyway, it's kind of cool. Uh, it's not that useful for, for a lot of people. And also it's fast. Fast. What does it mean fast? So, this is a comparison of our benchmark set. It's our benchmark set I'm saying up front. And it's an all normalized time that CPython 2.6 took, so... Uh, this is one. And less is better. So this is like probably 10% faster. This is slightly about twice faster. This one would be like 20 times probably. Yeah, or 25 maybe. So it all depends on the benchmark. And you can scroll here. So for this benchmark set, it's not given for all benchmark set. PyPy is quite a bit faster than CPython, somewhere between 20% and 30 times faster. It also, it also evolved quite a bit over time. So this is the graph uh, of Django benchmark and starts at here's May 2010, I think. Here's May 2011. Uh, and this is CPython. So again, lower is better. We started about three times faster. Now we are about 12 times faster and decreases over time. So we were quite hard all the time. Uh, this is year and a half, I think. So, status. Uh, we, unlike CPython, we release quite often. 1.6 is, I believe, the third release this year. And we plan to release 1.7 soon, or 1.6.1, depends. Uh, it was released in August, and it's compatible with Python 2.7.1. It doesn't implement Python 3 yet, although there are plans. It's pretty compatible. If we are incompatible, or in a few documented cases, it's a bug, so we'll fix it. Most programs work. Libraries like Twisted, Django, Pyramid, I think, Eventlet, a lot of this stuff just works on PyPy, while C extensions sometimes work, sometimes don't. We have a C API that helps with this a bit, but it's experimental in its alpha. Uh, it also contains no packages in progress. It hasn't been done yet, but it implements basic array operations. And NoPy is somewhere between 
three times faster and 300 times faster, depends on what you do. It's sometimes really fast. And Python is pretty stable. You can use it in production. In fact, people like Quora moved completely to Python their, their servers because I think Quora's are like two times win over moving, just changing the interpreter from C Python to Python. Uh, what you can do, you can try using Python on your own programs. There is like there is nothing preventing you from doing that. Python is just a free software, you can just go and take it. And if you complain about Python, Python performance, there's nothing really that justifies not trying. It might not work, it might work, but it's worth trying. How many of you ever had performance problems with Python? Quite a few people. Uh, sorry? Well, depends. <laughs> and your program should not, should not require changes. There are a few changes that you might not be aware of, like PyPy, like Jiton, and like Iron Python implements uh, a real garbage collector. So, for example, if you don't close your file, it won't necessarily be closed immediately. Uh, so, you're supposed to close your files, otherwise, you might run out of file descriptors or things like this. Uh, you should not need to change much. Examples. Because people always complain that it's all just stuff. So, LWN uh, wrote an article some time ago when they compared parsing of git log uh, some statistics. And CPI was 63 seconds, by 21 seconds. I'm pretty sure that was like half a year ago or so. Python is now faster than that. Uh, and what they say is they say that it works and it's fast, and they didn't require any changes to their code base, which is also pretty good. Another example is MyHDL. It's a, it's a language for developing boards. So, so if you want to make a custom chipset, I know it's not your primary use case for Python, but uh, for some people, it's very important, and it's usually, yeah. Does yeah. Again. Yes, the, so the question was whether my HDL generate Python from the specification. And yes, it, it takes the specification and compiles it to Python. And then you get Python that runs your chip emulation, essentially. So it's now competitive with, with actually used VHDL and very good simulators. For example, uh, a place in South Africa that builds a telescope is considering moving all they have into my HDL, ju just because it's much more convenient to use. And now it's actually as fast as everything else. So what, what they said, you can go to the website, I'm sure they updated this, but this is, a, this is a good case scenario. This is a place where you generate a simple Python that does a lot of numeric computations, and the results are 6 to 12 times faster than using C Python, and that bridges the gap between C and Python, essentially. So how can you help with Python? Python? You can try it on your application. We want to know if it's slow. We want to know if it doesn't work. And we want to know if it's not slow and actually works. Also, we want to know that. You can tell other people. You can contribute. It's not that hard. It sounds hard, but it's actually not. You, what we have is we have a lot of separation of, of abstractions. So interpreter is here. Garbage collector is there. Uh, just in time compiler is somewhere else, and you can contribute to all kinds of things. For example, there are students who are implementing uh, just in time compiler backend for ARM phones or ARM devices in general, including phones. There's another student that uh, creates PowerPC backend, and there are various people who, who do random stuff that's not necessarily connected, and that's the beauty of architecture that you can. You don't need to know C, unlike contributing to C Python. You actually have to know C, and that's a bit annoying because you're a Python programmer. But it's enough to know Python to contribute to Python. Or so we say. Uh, then you can donate. We just run a campaign for uh, 
creating Python 3 interpreter within PyPy, a donation campaign, and we plan to launch very soon another proposal for implementing NumPy. And NumPy is a very obvious target. Uh, PyPy already performs really well on the numeric computations, and <laughs> essentially bringing NumPy to bridge the gap between, you, you, you might not need to use C or Fortran for most cases. Like, not all of them, but for most cases you might as well write Bloom in Python. I'll show you in a second. Uh, so, there are cool things that I have. I'm not sure how many of them work, actually. So this is uh, this is an image processing algorithm. Not sure. Mm. Oh, can see anything? Not much. Yeah. Oh, great. This is an edge detection algorithm. So actually the original video looks like this and well, it's a video and then if you, if you run this using a simple Python program, well not that simple, but you get this, so you get edge detection and this gets about 40 frames per second, so it's real time processing and let's run this using C Python for comparison. We're gonna have to wait for a frame for a bit. <laughs> wait some more. <laughs> okay, so we get 0 0.06 frames per second. That's about like, well, 100 times slower, something like that. Uh, no more, like 300 times slower. So this is this is a very good case where you have oh, here we go, uh, where you get things that you couldn't do potentially with C Python because it wasn't possible to do real time image processing. But now you can do this, and it's now pure Python. The, The program looks like this, and this this is roughly the inner loop. And as you can see, writing this sort of stuff in C would be a bit annoying because you have to allocate all the all the arrays and everything, and they're they're not static; they're pretty dynamic. So you can write this stuff in Python, and it actually works, and it's fast enough to to do this sort of processing. Uh, and this is, this is a good example because it uses a uh, Python level iterator over all the pixels. So, image would be something like an actual class that has get item, set item, and things like that. This is much easier to prototype if you, if you can write Python instead of, instead of C because you can just write one algorithm using various classes that have custom access to attributes. Just a total mess. Actually, those 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 algorithms were implemented in C for for communication conversion purposes, and they're like hundreds of lines copied and pasted and changed to use different different things. So it's kind of hard. So this is real time video processing. Software rendered games. So this is well, it looks a bit silly. This is a webcam processing image that's doing software level 3D on it. So you can look over a webcam picture and it looks like this. Let's get closer. Oh, it's a webcam. And that's like real time image processing and changing colors in Python. So again, I think that gets like I think about 10 frames per second using Python and gets like 0, 0.0 point something on, on C Python. And the thing is, this is just the beginning. Uh, things like having a fast Python interpreter open like a whole new world of 
things you can do in Python that you couldn't do before. Like you can go and have an entire class on algorithms at the university or or say uh, numeric stuff that you just do using NumPy and you don't have to worry about all this Fortran stuff or MPI or whatever. You can you can use high level concepts to express low level algorithms and still hope that it actually will work. Okay, I guess this is roughly it. I'm waiting for questions. Can you come here because I don't think people will hear you.
C extensions, for example, are one hard thing that you need to break. So the secret is that PyPy is written in Python. <laughs> yes, that's, that's one of the good parts. Uh, and even though the majority is written in Python, you said... No, all of it. All of it, but you said the JIT compiles to assembly. Yes, but it's written in Python. Yeah, I can show you. I mean, the, the end product is, is pure Python too. What? So how do the JIT assembly generate code interact with the byte code? It's usually now. A quite hard question, but it's it's generating for each byte code. It, it it looks into interpreter and instead of interpreting, it generates a sender for that. So for example, this is how it looks like. Say. Well, somewhere on the get the right idea. So th this is the piece of JIT generator. Uh, so this is reading an, I an item of an array. Uh, so it unparks arguments like a normal Python to block back and then does other apps up, which is a normal Python function call. <coughs> Somewhere here, the return is a Python class that's address location, and then generates a sender on top of that. And actual assembly generator should look like this. This is x86 mock instruction between somewhere in heap and EPX, for example. It, this is what generates assembly. I can show you. Uh, I have extra slides. Uh, so this is the function. Uh, not a very complex one. I will make it one bigger. <laughs> okay, so this is a function that adds numbers. Uh, and I have a tool here. So this is the same function. And this is the bytecode of the function. Uh, so actually, you can see that the first part of the function didn't get compiled because it ran only once and compiled only the loop. So this is bytecode, log fast i, log cost 100, and then compare. And these two generated no, no code whatsoever. And those things are comparison on the assembler level. So I could even have a button somewhere. So this is an x86 comparison instruction between the register and the memory address and the jump. And this is this Python code, this precise me, got compiled to like two assembler instructions. Then you have i plus equals one, it got compiled to and again one assembler instruction which is equivalent to one intermediate operation. And then a bit of code, this is the code that cares about making control C work. So you, you need to get an exception and not randomly abort program. So you checked. It couldn't potentially be done better, but I still think that like eight assembly instructions per Python loop is not that bad. Question related to this. I know how I know how Iron Python was developed, and the fact that when they do the JIT compilation, that compile code can be shared within the .NET VM. Do you have something similar where uh, I've got a PyPy process that did a JIT compile to a piece of code, for example, this one, and then I run another instance of PyPy and already knows, oh, I already did a JIT compilation for this, I won't have to do no, it. No, there's a major difference between the way Iron Python works. So Iron Python is implemented on top of, yeah, yeah. of a VM and compiles stuff to a VM. And CLR, or however the VM is called, actually says you can compile everything to a VM and be fast. So we decided no. We don't think it's a good way because languages are different, too, too different. So instead you write an interpreter and then you have a thing that takes an interpreter and generates a JIT compiler for that. So you end up having JIT directly in the assembler 
from Python bytecode actually, but it might be Python source code. It doesn't matter that much. But you, you don't have an, a step where you have a common virtual machine that, that you okay, can so there's, there's no reuse of that JIT compilation within. You can use JIT compilation, but you can reuse a VM. So, say, object model will be different. If you implement, say, PHP in PyPy, yeah. you still you implement PHP interpreter essentially. But you don't use the same VM. Your runtime is. Yeah, yeah, I'm asking more of a, if I'm doing a JIT compilation of a Python code, right? And it actually is this. Now it's done by a process of PyPy doing one well, thing. And I got another process of PyPy and it has to do a lot again, again that JIT compilation or not. That's my question. Yes, and that has essentially has to be. Yes. Uh, what difficulties do you see in order for PyPy to become the default uh, Python? What do you mean by default? Like, uh, it, it, I, I don't think it will ever be reference implementation. Like, people who care about language design are familiar with CPython. They will say that we deliberately said we don't care about language design, we just care about implementation. So, Python is complex in many places, but uh, it's. You would rather have. Uh, <laughs> CPython still say uh, reference implementation and PyPy be used. And the, the things that can prevent it is like C extensions. For example, LXML doesn't work on PyPy or any other Cyclone project actually. So th this is actually a problem because some people, a lot of people want to use that. It gradually will get there, but it will take time for libraries to adopt. But also things like it's Sometimes it's hard to make a move because you actually have lots of Python running and you don't want to move because it's effort. If you're not super happy. So there's also inertia associated with that. But other than that, I think it's getting there at some point. Just will take time for a few years. Which are the, the, the most common pickups you will find when moving from C Python to Python? I think the single most common is uh, closing files. So people would write things like this. And then they expect stuff to be in file <coughs> by now. And that's not true. In PyPy, the file wasn't, wasn't closed by now. So instead, you have to write things like. Yeah. And now you have stuff written to a file. So this is the reference counting difference. And this is the single most common difference. There, the other ones are obscure ones, like. I'll show you one really obscure. Yeah, that's actually what you said. What was related with uh, C, C extensions? Yeah, C extensions are problems on its own, but this is for Python code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for C, I think NumPy is the most requested thing because people really want PyPy to run their numeric code fast. But my favorite one is. So what that would print? <coughs> so that prints, among other things, this guy. So I will copy to a bigger font. So any clue what this is? The variable name underscore square bracket one square bracket. And then yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's at least being built. And guess what Jacko did? Jacko relied on exact naming of this variable. Not only that you have square brackets in there. So then throw some tests. So people rely on really obscure details sometimes. 
that, that's precisely because this comprehension is not a language feature and you have to build it somewhere. So you use a local variable named obscurely so you can't access it really. So various things like this. Okay, I think we're good then. Thank you.